Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. This week's cocktail is called The Crow, and it is a featured cocktail in today's episode, as usual. I'm going to start with a shaker with ice. To that, we're going to add whiskey. Two ounces. That's what I'm using. Next, lemon juice. One ounce freshly squeezed lemon juice from the plastic lemon. Next, grenadine, a splash. A splash of grenadine. There you go. And we shake. Take our cocktail glass. And we strain it in. And there you have it, boys and girls, the crow. Don't know why it's called a crow, but whatever. Not bad. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the podcast. See ya. It's all fun and games until nature gets pissed off. And in this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock explores the man versus nature theme, utilizing one of Greg's favorite things, the Hitchcock Blonde. Sure, the birds are beating the crap out of everyone, but hey, Tippy sure is pretty to look at. Now, if she only wasn't so distracted by her ever-present cigarettes, another Greg favorite. Let's just say, if there's a murder happening behind you, Try to pay attention. Cheers. Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different yet highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. How are you, Greg? I'm good. I'm good, Karen. Thanks for asking. I know everybody who's listening can't see Greg, but he is looking mighty fine and spiffy in a new Scary Spirits shirt that's <laughs> royal blue. I think it's turquoise, isn't it? It's kind of turquoisey. Is it setting off your eyes? <laughs> my eyes are brown, Karen, if you haven't noticed. Damn it. You have, you've never looked into my eyes, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I believe this film was your choice, Karen, this week. Was it? Was it not? It was. And what film have you chosen for us to partake this week? I've chosen the 1963 movie, The Birds. Any reason you chose this film, Karen? You're going to be so proud of me. This film was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, whose birthday was just last Sunday. If you're listening to this podcast the day it comes out, or even the week it comes out. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are, Karen. Any idea how old Mr. Hitchcock would have been if he had lived? To today. I have no idea. 102. Okay. 134 years old. No, oh, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> I made him a lot younger. He would have liked that. Probably. 
You're not a Hitchcock blonde, though, Karen. So no, I am not. <laughs> you ain't got that going for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Probably good for you, Karen. Actually, <laughs> well, in the movies, anyway. <laughs> yes. Might you have a cocktail for us, Karen? I do. And what would that be? It's called the crow. And how would we make the crow? There's lots of recipes. Okay, you're going to need two-thirds parts whiskey, one-third part, I used fresh lemon juice, and a dash of grenadine. Real lemons, Karen. I always tell you mine are real. <laughs> and a dash of grenadine. What did you use as your part, Karen? I just used an ounce. So you put two ounces of whiskey and one ounce of lemon juice. Yes. That's what I did, too. We are a match. And a dash. Of grenadine. Yes. And to be honest, I used um, Jack Daniels honey whiskey. Because mm, that's, that's what that's what I had. And it was open. And well, let me finish telling you how to make it before we start talking about how <laughs> delicious it is. Put it in a shaker with cracked ice, shake to chill it, and then strain it into a cocktail glass. I'm going to say I don't hate it. Any idea why it's called the crow? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't either. It doesn't look like a crow. It's not dark. Mm -hmm. It's not black. No. It's kind of Maybe old crows pinkish. drink it. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I used uh, Maker's Mark for my whiskey can. And I used the squeezed, freshly squeezed lemon from the plastic lemon. <laughs> you prefer plastic. We all know it. <laughs> <laughs> Give people time to make their drink. All right, hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. Might you have a brief synopsis for us, Karen? I do. Go on. Tell me a story. Melanie Daniels meets Mitch Brenner in a San Francisco pet store and decides to follow him home. She brings with her the gift of two lovebirds and they strike up a romance. One day, birds start attacking children at Mitch's sister's party. A huge assault starts on the town by the attacking birds. Thank you, Karen. We are a match. Once again, we're two for it's two. Ooh, it's going to be a good one. That's not a very good description, though. It's fairly accurate. Leaves lots out, but... Well, she doesn't really... just follow him home. No, I think it's creepier than that. I you know. know, I agree. <laughs> but, I mean, from the very beginning, it's creepy, I think. For, on both of their parts. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So we'll get to it, right? That's the plan. Are you ready to get into it? Yep, let's go. All right. The Birds from 1963. The film opens and we have credits, Karen. Yes, and I watched it on couple Amazon minutes. Prime. Yeah, I did as well. No warnings that I saw. Rated PG-13. Okay. So a couple minutes of credits, and then we see who we learn is Melanie, right? Walking around. But I'm going to stop you before you even start. Okay. Because Edith Head yes. designed yes. Melanie's costume. I, I noticed that. Says, which is basically one. Mm -hmm. Well, two. But I guess. <laughs> so she's famous and I know it. So I looked her up. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've, I remember I've seen her name quite a bit, I believe, in these films. We've yes. Done. And she's spoofed in The Incredibles also. Okay. Edith Head was an American costume designer who won a record eight Academy Awards for Best Costume Design between 1949 and 1973 making her the most awarded woman in the Academy's history. She's considered to be one of the greatest and most influential costume designers in film history. And if you see pictures of her, she often wore dark glasses, round, dark glasses. So she was known for using rainbow of hues to set the mood, whether she was designing for black and white or color. And her trademark dark glasses were in fact blue lensed so she could get a sense of how black and white photographed a trick used by costume designers during the golden age of Hollywood. Hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. You have the list of her Oscars that she won for the movies. I do not, but this was not one of them. Yeah. I did check that. 
Yeah, this was, uh, I don't know that this won any Oscars. It was nominated for Best Special Effects. I do know that. And it is a horror story. The Birds is a Horror Story by British writer Daphne Dumar, first published in her 1952 collection, The Apple Tree. The story is set in her home county of Cornwall shortly after the end of the Second World War. And a farmhand and his family and community come under lethal attack from flocks of birds. Okay, now you can start the film. <laughs> All right, Let's... so as I said, we have credits. And we see Melanie walking around a city, which appears to be San Francisco, Karen. Yes, as soon as you see the trolley car. And she's beautifully dressed and well put together. Yeah, she looks pretty good in this. Especially at the beginning. She, she, she changes a little bit throughout the film, I think. But not drastically, but I just said... She just doesn't look quite the same as the beginning. But anyway. <laughs> well, she's tortured. Yeah, but I mean, before all that stuff happens. But we see her entering a pet shop just as Alfred Hitchcock is leaving. Yes, with, with two dogs. His dogs, Jeffrey and Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> there are also adorable kittens in the window, and it looks like monkeys in the other window. But she goes in, and apparently she ordered a minor bird, and it was scheduled to arrive that day or something. It's a, it's a minor bird, M-Y-N-H, and they come from the Starling family. They're a soft bill species native to Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Indonesia. It's been widely introduced and now lives in most of the world in the wild. And in ancient Greece, the minor bird was an aristocratic pet. There are two types of minor birds that are kept as pets. The variety that most Western pet owners get as a pet is the one that can speak like a human. The common mina is often considered a pest. So it's the hill mina that most people have because that's the one that can learn to talk. And Melanie did, did see some seagulls before she came in, like a flock of them gathering. And she asked the shopkeeper and, she says perhaps there's a storm that is forcing them inland. Sometimes that happens. So then a man enters, who we learn later, much later, is Mitch Brenner. But I wrote he mistakes her for a store employee, or he acts like he does. Yes, I thought he did too. And he wants a pair of lovebirds, right? And and she's intrigued by him. Yeah, they're a little flirty, I wrote. <laughs> so she <laughs> pretends to be a worker at the pet store so she can talk to him. And I said, I wrote, the man seems suspicious when Tip, or I called her Tippy here, when Melanie doesn't know what she's talking about. about no, birds. she <laughs> he keeps asking her questions and she's, but she's messing up everyone. But she's answering very confidently, though. Yes, she is. Like, she knows exactly what she's talking about. But she doesn't. And she tries to show the man a bird. She takes it out of the cage and it flies away from her. So they try to chase it. And the man traps it. In an ashtray with his hat, Karen. Because, yes. of course, there are ashtrays everywhere in 1963. Yes. <laughs> Big ones. <laughs> he saves the day. And then we, the man calls Melanie by her name. And apparently he knows her from a court case. And I guess she's some kind of prankster and has been sued for negligence or some shit before. Yes, she's a practical joker. Apparently she's a party girl. That's kind so of basically, what we're finding out. So basically this dude is stalking her. Right. Well, I don't think he's stalking her necessarily. He met her, not met her. He saw her in court. Yeah. She must have made an impression on him. But he did go into the pet store to find the birds okay. for his sister. So you think his story is legit? You don't think he followed, was following her around and followed her into the pet store? I don't think so, because later the sister says they're just what I wanted. That's true. She does. So I think... It's a happy coincidence okay. for him that she's there. But he did investigate who she was because he knows a lot about her. Mm -hmm. He well, knows who she is. She's in, and, apparently she's in all the papers, Karen, in the well, gossip but, columns. <laughs> but he did look to find out who she was. So he leaves, drives off in his Ford Galaxy, Karen. And Melanie gets his license number, license plate number. She calls a newspaper and we learn that I guess her dad is like the owner or some shit of the newspaper. Yes. Daddy owns the newspaper. And, and she has someone call the Department of Motor Vehicles and find out who owns the car. Yes, that's creepy. And, and then she, she 
yeah. orders lovebirds from the shopkeeper. Two of them. You're supposed to buy lovebirds in pairs. Next, we see Melanie carrying, I guess, the lovebirds in a cage. And she's going to, an, she's in an apartment building, I guess, in an elevator with a man. And she, they both get off the same floor. She goes to. Okay. So, yes. So, right. Number one, first invasion of privacy. She gets his information from someone at the newspaper right then. Uh -huh. That shouldn't have happened already. But she found out where he lives. So well, she's going there. You know, if you know people, you know people, Karen. Okay. Good to know, Greg. Yeah. I know people. <laughs> I mean, ask, hey, if I gave you like a guy's license number, could you like do a background check on him? I've done that before. You know, you got to protect your daughters and stepdaughters and whatnot, right? Not that I've ever done that. I've just, you know, you know, just in case, just in case I wanted to. You just I got could. that in your back pocket. Yeah, just in case. So anyway, she goes to, I guess, apparently Mitch's apartment and leaves the birds outside the door with a card with his name on it. But the man who was in the elevator is apparently Mitch's neighbor and tells her that Mitch is out of town for the weekend. Everybody gives up information very I freely know, in this film. Exactly. Here's the second invasion of privacy. Not only does he no, tell where her, does he go? Oh, he goes up to Bodego Bay every weekend. Bodega Bay. Bodega. Whatever. Every weekend he stays there. It's 60 miles north of here. Yeah, where is that? She says, Oh, it's just 60 miles up the coast. <laughs> tells her which highways to take. I will tell you that Bodega Bay is a village. In Sonoma County, California, with a population of 912 in the 2020 census. Wow. Yeah. Small town, even. It's on the eastern side of Bodega Harbor, an inlet of Bodega Bay on the Pacific Coast. It's most widely known from this film. Sure. So next we see Melanie in her 1954 Aston Martin DB2-4 drophead coupe, Karen. Yeah, it's a fancy car. Convertible. Driving with the birds, yep. And there's yeah. a funny part in there. Any any idea what one of those uh, went for? Brand new, Karen. We haven't done this in a while, but uh, the car was fancy I had a enough. Bad I think feeling. we should. It's a fancy I think car. we might have done it, though. It sounds familiar. An Aston Martin DB2-4 or slash 4. I don't know. I know we've done Aston Martins before. So this is a 1954. Okay. It's a 54. 54. Aston Martin DB2 slash 4 drophead coupe. What do you think that vehicle went for brand new? 5,800. Not bad. I was going to say go over. Six I was going to say 62. Oh, it's 62.95. Oh, you're <laughs> shitting me. I was 62 was in my head. And I was like, nope. no, just go lower. All right, Karen. What do you think that vehicle goes for now? You just throw out a price and I'll tell you whether you're in the low, the mid or the high. <laughs> it's probably got it's probably popular and it's probably a wide range, right? Yeah. I'm going to say 100,000. OK, so you are closest to the low. Wow. But you're a little over the low. Average low retail today is $95,200. Wow. It, it can go, the mid range is 127000 So you're only 27000 off that. I but. could have talked him down 27000 <laughs> And the average high, $238,900. Wow. Average high. That's That's the high. So she drives up to... I guess the bay. She arrives at the bay with the Okay, birds. stop, though, because when she's driving, it's windy. And yeah, if you've she's... ever driven on um, California coastal highways, they are very windy. She's got a little lead foot, too. I think. She does. She's driving erratically, <laughs> but there's a shot where not she's driving going erratically. Around, just not erratically, but... Tire squeal every now and then. But... She's not driving safely. There's no one else on the road, Karen. Well, that's nice. She has it to herself. But they do a shot from behind the birds. The two birds are sitting on the that perch. Is. And when she goes around some turns, the birds le lean. The, yeah. They lean and then they lean the other direction. I thought that was funny. That was a pretty good shot. And she's wearing a mink coat. She's not wearing sunglasses, which must be hard in a convertible, but whatever. Well, it's she's in a green screen too or whatever. There's lots of green screen effects in this film. So then she goes into a combination hardware slash grocery slash post office store. 
and everybody's looking at her probably yeah. because she's new and, and she's wearing she's a mean fancy. coat and she's fancy pants. She's a Hitchcock blonde, Karen. Well, that's true. My Snim- mom had an outfit just like that green one she's wearing. Nice. Oddly enough, maybe a little darker. So anyway, she just walks up to the proprietor of the store slash postmaster. Yeah, I call him the postmaster. <laughs> and asks, where's Mitch live? <laughs> Basically. He, and he just tells her. Just, oh, see that house? Well, he tells her, but then she says, well, where is that? And he takes her out front, points across the bay right at the house, tells her exactly how to get there. She says she doesn't want to be seen. She wants to surprise him. I know, like, that's not suspicious at all. So he tells, well, you can take a boat. And, okay. Can you get that for me? Yeah. Why, yes. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Have you ever rid- driven a boat? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he believes her. But the store clerk order- orders the boat for her. And I wrote, Melanie is full of questions. She wants to know the name of Minch's sister. Right? The store clerk and another guy, they can't agree on which name, what the name is. Whether it's Alice or Lois or something. Right. So the store clerk tells her, oh, well, if you really want to know, go here. Go just past the school at the house with the red mailbox and the school teacher lives there. You can ask her. <laughs> I, was, I wrote, I literally said, this is way too easy to get information. I know. So, of course, Melanie does. She does that. She goes and we meet Annie, the school teacher, played by Suzanne Plachette. And Famous for new heart, right? She yeah. was a new heart. I think so. That's what most people probably know her from. And she tells Melanie that the girl's name is Kathy. Sure, I'll tell you. Yeah. You yeah. know Mitch? How do you know Mitch? Oh, I met him in San Francisco. Well, everybody meets Mitch in San Francisco, whatever. But there's some, I don't know, there's some weird. It seems like. Chemistry there. Annie kno- knows Mitch and wants to know Mitch more and is a little upset that other women are coming to see Mitch. That's all. And Annie lights a Marlboro and offers one to Annie or Melanie. And they smoke together. And they smoke together. Lots of smoking in this film, which I remembered from watching this film in high school, Karen. Yeah, I don't remember much. You remember watching it, though? I remember we watched it, but I don't remember. I couldn't either, but I was was watching it. I'm like, oh, yeah. I remember I made notes about that. It was important. It was symbolism of some sort, but I got no idea what it means now. <laughs> so anyway. But Annie sees the lovebirds that she's bringing over for Mitch and makes the assumption. Mm. She's like, good yeah. luck. Yeah, it says good luck. So then Melanie goes to the dock to get her boat. And she makes out a card to Kathy. So she rips she up the letter that she had for Mitch and puts a card for Kathy. So she makes her starts making her way across the bay, you know, in her little outboard engine, little boat there. And she can handle herself. I mean, she, she gets she gets right down in that boat in her heels. She knows how to operate the motor. Well, the guy starts it for her. Yeah, but she is confident in the boat she and is. gets right across the lake or the bay. Yeah. So as she's going across the bay, she sees the Brenners leaving the house and going into like, the, well, I think Mitch goes into the barn and the mother and daughter get in the car and drive away. Yes. So she cuts the engine and starts rowing because she doesn't want anyone to see her or hear her. Or hear her. Again, that's, I was impressed with her. Gets across the bay, docks the boat, and then she walks up to the house and walks in. Just walks right in. Yep. Places the birds on an ottoman here and leaves a note for Kathy. Gets back in the boat the whole time, like looking around, be sure no one's watching. And Rose starts rowing across back across the bay. Then she watches Mitch enter the house from the boat. From the boat. She pretends to get down, but yeah, you can't get down that far in a boat that size. And he comes running out and is obviously looking for her. Right. Yeah. He's looking down the road, but then he gets his binoculars. Yeah. He sees the boat, runs back in, gets his binoculars. And then he smiles, Karen, as he sees who it is. He does. She's and trying to. She's trying to duck, but I think she kind of wants to her, be seen. Just her beautiful <laughs> eyes are above the boat rim, and her lovely blonde hair. Yes. So he jumps in his car and he drives away, and he's he's hauling ass too, Karen. <laughs> yeah, he wants to beat her back to the dock. Yeah. So she watches as he drives around the bay to the dock, and he is there waiting for her when she arrives. Then a seagull dive bombs her, and she begins bleeding. Yes, Mitch right jumps. before she gets to the dock, yeah. 
Mitch jumps down and helps her get out of the boat. Yeah, she's bleeding. So he takes her to a restaurant to clean her wounds because, you know, that's what you do, Karen. Go to the restaurant, clean your wounds. Well, it's probably the only place in the town. I guess it could have gone to the grocery hardware post office. I probably got like, oh, that's and true. Shit there, but, yeah. but whatever. That's true. The restaurant owner mentions that Mitch is a lawyer. Well, the restaurant owner wants to know what happened because he's afraid she's going to sue. Did she trip outside? What happened? I know you're a lawyer. And then Mitch has asked Melanie what she's doing there. And she lies. And she's a good liar. But he don't believe her. But says she's in town to see her friend. And Mitch says, well, who's your friend? And she says, Annie, the school teacher. (laughs) She knows her last name, Annie Hayworth. Yeah. She says they went to college together. And I wrote, I don't think Mitch believes her, but she's very no, confident. But she's going. Yeah, she's going with it. And right here I wrote, what is Mitch wearing around his neck? Not quite an ascot, is it? No, it's more like a it's... scarf or something, but it's not like it's not like the Fred from the the Scooby Doo. Uh, Scooby Doo. The... It's not that. It's because it's it's tight. It's just like a circle. Yeah. Yeah, or it's a know. tied scarf and he tucked the ends oh, in. Oh, could have. I don't know. But I've never seen it before. Pants are up to his armpits, too. That was the style back then. I noticed later he's wearing like some... I like his pants later. Like, almost They're like almost like cargo cargos. Yep. Yeah. So then Mitch's mother enters the restaurant and everything turns cold, Karen. <laughs> she does not look pleased when Mitch introduces Melanie. Nope. She doesn't seem to like Melanie, I wrote. But Mitch invites Melanie to dinner. So then Melanie goes to Annie's house and she reluctantly kind of agrees, but not really. She gives herself an out, you know, she says, well, I don't know. I don't know what Annie has planned, but she says, I may, I may be there. So well, Melanie because, goes, well, she gets a little, as Mitch says, well, I'll pick you up because dinner's at seven. Yeah. And she says, well, yeah, I'm not sure what Annie has planned because she doesn't even know if she can stay at Annie's yeah, or Mitch whatever. asks her, where are you staying? And she right. says, Oh, Annie at Annie's of course. <laughs> but Annie did have a sign in her window. I noticed earlier that said room. See, for I didn't rent. see it earlier. I did. But... So then Melanie goes to Annie's house, back to Annie's and asks to rent the room for one night. And Annie makes a comment about seagulls migrating. Why are they always migrating? So Melanie does decide to go to the Brenner house for dinner. Annie lets her stay the one night, but she's she not very happy about it. I mean, she's okay, but she's, Whatever. you can see Annie's wounded a lot in this movie. No one else is, you it. know, she's like, what do you call that? Hold, carrying a torch for someone or something. I don't know if she is or not, but well, I guess she probably is. I mean, I don't know. I we'll get she there. Kind of is. We'll get there. So at the Brenner's, Melanie meets Kathy, Mitch's younger sister. She's pretty, she's like 11. Right? Isn't that the deal? He's supposed to be 11, yeah. So how much, how old do you think Mitch is? So there's like 20 difference, 20 years difference probably between the two of them at least? That's probably in reality. It's probably like 15 or 12, okay. you know, like what they're trying to say. But yes, it's a big difference. Because his mom doesn't look all that much older than him, really. Uh, Lydia is her name and it's Jessica Tandy. Yeah. I don't know how much older she is than him, but she looks good. She doesn't look like we picture Jessica Tandy. <laughs> so we learn that uh, Lydia's chickens won't eat. And she That's makes his a mother. call. Yeah, yeah. She makes a call to the guy who sold her the feed. And right here, I wrote, Jessica Tandy is a good actress. <laughs> she is. But uh, Lydia calls the man who sold her the chicken feed, and she learns that another man's chickens aren't eating either. But they're having they eat they're eating different feed because of course she thought there was something wrong with the feed, and then she worries that there may be a chicken flu or something going around. Karen, yes, the faucet farm, his chickens aren't eating either. Then Melanie sits at the piano and plays while she talks to Kathy, and Kathy asks if Melanie's going to come to her birthday party tomorrow. It's a surprise, but she knows all about it. She's figured it out. Yes, she's a precocious little eleven-year-old. Then we cut to Mitch's mother, Lydia, questioning him about Melanie, right? Yeah. And she says she has read about Melanie in the newspaper. Apparently, she jumped into a fountain in Rome naked. (laughs) That's the story. She's always in the papers. In the gossip pages. 
They don't have those anymore, do they, Karen? The gossip pages. No, not really. But basically, Lydia is not. Maybe out in California they do. No, not really. (laughs) She's not approving of Melanie. Of all the girls you dated, what's your percentage of mothers that approved of you? Did they generally say, yeah, he's Mothers approved of me or my mother approved of my girlfriends? Oh, both. Because that's kind of what we're dealing with here, right? True. So what did, how many approved? But yeah, but I want to see if your percentage is lower than mine because mine's abysmal, but go ahead. I don't think my mom liked any of mine. <laughs> so, Except your current one. Yeah, except my current. And she was. Not his current girlfriend, his wife. <laughs> no, no. If she knew my girlfriend, she wouldn't like her either. No. <laughs> Still holds true. So zero. Pretty much. And she was, she's, she's pretty, pretty spot she, on. Pretty. Was she vocal about it? No, but you can tell. Could the girls tell too? Yes. <laughs> they usually can't. And so how many, yeah, I think of all the people I dated, I think maybe two of the mothers liked me. Uh, maybe. Did you date lots of uh, only child boys? Like no. I was? Okay. No. No, I guess you didn't, just, did you? The just, few I knew weren't only children. It's <laughs> just something, something about me, Greg. I heard too ambitious. Uh, what else? I can't, like, that's the one that stuck in my head. I'm like, really? Me? Okay. But yeah, doesn't want to have a family right away. But that girl's going to be a doctor someday. <laughs> She's not going to have time for a family. Not good enough, not smart enough. The list goes on and on. But yeah, I did not do well yeah, with moms. It's a, I think it's a mother-son thing. It's just, just no girl's good enough for their son, I don't think. Really? Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think it's I a got, thing. Oh, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, the shoe may be on the other foot. Yeah, we'll Sometimes. circle around. We'll circle back around because I've got two. We'll see how it goes. All right. So anyway, next Mitch asks Melanie. And she's getting ready to leave. If they could see each other back in San Francisco, maybe they could go swimming, Karen. Yes, he's teasing her. Which and she explains nice. that she yeah. was pushed into that fountain and she was fully clothed. That that story was published by a rival newspaper of her father's. A rival of her father's newspaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. You said a, the way you said it, it sounded like her father published it. But whatever, it doesn't matter. And he doesn't believe her. I mean, well, she's been lying the whole time. So, but I don't she know does right believe. here come clean about not knowing Annie and all that shit. She yes. made all that shit up. Yes, but he still hurts her feelings a little bit, and she peels out and leaves. And we see birds on a telephone wires, Karen. Yes, as she leaves. So back at Annie's house, Melanie and Annie have some brandy, and Annie tells Melanie that she originally came to Bodego Bay for a weekend with Mitch and decided to stay. Well, she talks about his mother. Yeah, they talk about Lydia and that Lydia is afraid of being abandoned. Because her husband just died four years ago. Yeah. But she's holding on to Mitch. She says they're still friends. And she moved there, even though their relationship was over at the time, the romantic relationship, that she still wanted to be close to him because they're friends. And now she's friends with Lydia because she's no longer a threat. She's no longer a threat. Yeah. Yeah. So next, the phone rings, Karen. And it's Mitch calling for Melanie. And right here I wrote, there's lots of one side to telephone conversations in this movie. And they do a good job with This them. is only the second one, yeah, but they're all good. There's a couple and they're more. all rotary phones. And I didn't point Duh. out, but um, at one point when Melanie dials the phone, she uses a pencil. You know why? That's what you do, Karen, on a rotary phone. <laughs> no, to make sure she doesn't break a nail. Yeah. Is that why you did it too? So you didn't break your nails? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Especially after they had rainbows and butterflies oh, on them. Nope, never had any of that. <laughs> well, I don't know. My my nieces may have gotten yeah. hold of my nails at some point, but I don't think there were rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were just sparkly. Yeah, like I was going to like the, your personality. Like I was going to a t- Taylor Swift show or something. Because apparently that's a prerequisite, Karen, I've learned. Oh, yes. be sparkly. There's big preparation for that, (laughs) they say. I don't know. But Mitch invites Melanie to Kathy's birthday party. And Annie says she is going as well to help. 
So then there's kind of a knock at the door and they go out and there's a seagull on the front porch. Apparently it ran right into the door and it gone, but it's laying on the porch. Cut to the birthday party. Well, before you do that, we the one other outfit that Melanie has, she brings in a paper bag to Annie's house and it's a little house on the prairie nightgown. Granny gown. Granny gown. Yeah. Playing on that gown. Yep. At the birthday party, next day, Mitch and Melanie go for a walk. And I wrote, they're drinking vodka? Question mark. They're drinking a clear <laughs> liquid in cocktail glasses as they're it looked walking around. Amber as they were walking up there. And then it turned clear. And they're walking in the dunes. And all I can think about is all the sand that would be in her shoes. She's in high heels. Because remember, she has one outfit. Yep. Because yeah. she wasn't going to stay. I just was like, oh, that's got to be the worst. Sand everywhere. And we learned that Melanie is actually a pretty good girl here, Karen. Yeah. She does lots of good shit, apparently. Because he she says, talks well, about why... what she does for a living. And she does not work, but she does keep herself busy with other causes and whatever. He invites her to stay for dinner again. And she says she can't stay. She has to go back to work in the morning. And he's surprised she has a job and you're right. She doesn't have job specifically, but she works for, it sounds like charity. And she's yes. And she's got classes that she takes. Yeah. She explains that she lost herself in Rome a little bit when all that was happening. And when she came back, she wanted to do good things. We also learned that Melanie's mom ran out with some man when she was a kid. 11, I think she says, the same age as Kathy, right? I think she said that, yeah. She did. She also says why she's buying the mine, which is for her Aunt Tessa, who's very prim and proper, and she's going to teach it to swear just to annoy her aunt. So she's still got that practical joker side, but she does a lot of good. But yes, she was 11 when she ran off with some man, and now she doesn't know where her mother is, and she doesn't know what a mother's love is. So we see, we get a little bit of, okay, we can like her now. Mm -hmm. So back at the party, seagulls begin attacking the children, Karen. Dive bombing the birthday party. Yes. And some of them look like early CGI, right? Like it's not really called CGI then, but it's what it is. It's not computer generated, but it's like superimposed and yeah, overlaid like and stuff. Yeah. yeah, but it's not terrible. It's not terrible. No, it's pretty good for the time. And some appear to be mechanical, like the physical birds that are actually on the children and attacking them, that are like pecking at them as they're lying on the ground, appear to be mechanical birds just doing, they just need to do one thing, go up and down. Are they, oh, are they puppets <laughs> or? I think they're mechanical. Gotcha. It looked to me. Yeah. But it's it's all it's all over the place, so you don't really get a good long look at any of them, right? No, it's quick cuts. So you see, it looks like a bird is pecking a kid's ear. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But when they all get inside, no one's really injured that badly. Now, there's some little cuts and things, but everyone runs inside. That night at dinner, the lovebirds begin making a ruckus, I wrote. And then birds start flying down through the chimney and begin attacking the Brenners and Melanie. Hundreds of birds. They sparrows, look like sparrows. Right? There were some parakeets in there too, but yeah. mostly sparrows. And Mitch tries to block the fireplace with an end table or a coffee table. But they, they just keep coming. I mean, they do. It's impressive how many birds there are. So they run out or they run into another room. I couldn't tell. They go through a door. I don't know if they're going outside or into another room that was enclosed. But next we cut and uh, Deputy Al is at the house. Deputy Al is pretty worthless. Yeah. But the whole time. Melanie watches Lydia clean up the broken china. Like she's studying Lydia intently, picking up broken china cups. It's kind of weird to me. But they are all trying to convince the deputy that the birds attacked. And something's got to be done about these birds, Deputy Al. Well, they do want us to look at the cups that are destroyed because that circles back a little bit later. A little bit, yeah. So then I think Melanie... it's more drawing our attention to it. So that we see the broken cups, tea cups, coffee cups, whatever they are. Next, Melanie decides to spend the night because, of course, Kathy asked her to spend the night because they have a spare bedroom, you know. And she, she finally agrees and 
Lydia don't look too happy. No, she doesn't. Next morning, Lydia takes her Ford F-250 to a farm, Karen. She talks to the farmhand and says, hey, is Dan, I think is his name, Dan around? And he says, I haven't seen him yet, but he's probably in the house. So she. This is the man that she called the feed store about. This is the man who bought the other feed and said his chickens weren't eating. So that's why she's going there. She said kind of on the phone, well, should I stop by there? Maybe something's wrong. So she's going there to check and see if there's something wrong with his chickens. Yeah. Yeah. So she, again, walks right in. She knocks and there's no answer. So she walks right in the farmhouse there and. Starts yelling for Dan, but then she sees the broken china cups hanging. Yes, on hooks, but they're broken, just like at her house. She goes upstairs and goes to a bedroom and finds the body of Dan with his eyes pecked out. I bet that was a big scare back then. He gone. Probably. She runs out hysterically, and she doesn't even tell the farmhand. She just runs out. She can't breathe. She's gasping for air. Gets her in a car and drives off. Speeds Throws home. her purse on the ground. She just. <laughs> she speeds home. I wrote she appears to be in shock. And she can't even tell Mitch what's wrong. She can't even tell him. She just runs into the house. Next we see Mitch and he's going to go to meet the deputy Al at the farm. And Melanie's going to stay because she's getting the mom some tea. And she tells them to be careful and they hug and. They kissy face. Kissy face. So Melanie takes Lydia some tea. Melanie tells Lydia that Mitch had to go over to the farm to meet with the deputy. And then Lydia begins worrying about Kathy at the school because it's full of windows, big windows, Karen. And then she talks about losing her husband. And how she wishes she was stronger because she depended on him too much for strength. And now all the strength is gone. She just wants to be able to relax and to sleep. But she keeps bringing up Kathy. Yeah, but she does say that she would like to understand Melanie, right? She's trying to make it, she's, she kind of makes a, an effort to get to know Melanie a little bit because apparently Mitch, she says Mitch likes Melanie and, but she says that she is afraid of being alone. And then she keeps asking about Kathy at the school and Melanie offers to go pick up Kathy at the school. Want me to go get her? So next Melanie arrives at the school in her. 1954 Aston Martin DB2 slash four drop head coupe with the top down, Karen, as you do. I know. <laughs> that's what I said. I think you would put the top up <laughs> with all this stuff that's going on. So she goes into the school and they're singing a song or some shit. So she goes out and waits on a bench next Annie to the tells playground. Her signals to her to go outside. It is a long ass song. Because she lights up a smoke and yeah, they're she's still singing. smoking a cigarette on school property, Karen. Couldn't do that shit today, could you? <laughs> Neither could you. <laughs> well, I never did, Karen. I always went off property when I was in high school. I'm not going to comment. Well, I did. Uh, she smokes a marble as birds begin to gather on the monkey bars and playground equipment behind her. Yes, and those are crows. They are, and she is oblivious to them until she sees one flying overhead. So she doesn't she, notice that there's a murder behind her. There is a murder behind her. Okay, so <laughs> the term murder has been used to describe groups of crows for centuries. According to some historians' accounts, this phrase might have originated from folklore stories that depicted these birds as omens of death or bad luck. One popular story tells the tale of a group of crows who gathered around a gallows where an executed person hung. Because they're scavengers, right? This gathering was seen as evidence that they were waiting for another victim to join them. But there's no scientific evidence behind these kinds of claims. Another theory suggests that since crows are intelligent animals and often hunt in large groups, their flock could be likened to plotting something sinister like human murderers do when planning an attack against someone else. So how many crows make a murder? Do you know? Is there a number? There's a number. number? So there has to be so many before it's an official murder? It's not a straightforward answer. People, uh, there's an agreed upon number that is is a general consensus. I'm going to say 13. That's a nice number. That would be a good number, but you only (laughs) need three. Three? Yeah. That's not quite a murder. Well, that's what it says I wouldn't call that a murder. 
the I'd general a, consensus. I would call that a trio, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> among ornithologists, is that Echo and Jekyll three, and a friend. <laughs> three or more crows can be considered a murder, All but right. she doesn't notice the murder behind her. No, until she sees the one flying overhead and she turns to follow it. And then she sees it lands on the monkey bars with all the others. And she's like, oh, shit. There's hundreds of them. (laughs) You've just listened to half of this week's episode. Are you loving it? If so, can you do us a big favor and leave a review wherever you listen? Reviews help us grow the podcast. We just want to say thanks so much for your support. Now let's get back to the good stuff. So then she enters the school just as just, Annie is about to release the children to the playground where all the crows are. She even opens the door. Melanie goes in and tells Annie to shut the door. And then she says, look out the window. And they see all the crows, the murder of crows. Annie tells the children. Big ass murder. (laughs) Yeah. Annie tells the children they're going to have a fire drill and that the children should who live close by the school are to head home and the others are to head down the hill to the hotel. She tells them all to be very quiet. Children leave and they're all screaming. (laughs) (laughs) They'll start running down the hill as the birds attack and peck at them. One girl falls and breaks her glasses. She yells for Kathy, Kathy. Well, that's the girl that has a Velma from Scooby-Doo moment. She falls and her glasses fall off and then (laughs) they're crushed and broken. So Kathy and Melanie go back and grab the girl and they jump into a nearby vehicle. And eventually the birds fly away. But it's pretty intense because they're inside the car and the birds are attacking the car. It's not just like they get in and the birds fly over. The birds are attacking the car and the children in front of them. Who are further down the hill. Cut to Melanie at the restaurant. She's talking to her dad on the telephone. Another one-way conversation here. Telling him about the birds. And apparently she's he's like treating her like a reporter or something. Because he's asking her all kinds of details. Because he wants to publish the story. How many children were hurt? How badly were they hurt? Anyone killed? <laughs> you know, whatever. I can just hear. I can imagine How many what he's crows? saying. Yeah. Right. She's like, I don't know. It was hundreds. And they attacked the children. And then Mrs. Bundy, the ornithologist, enters the restaurant, Karen, and gets a pack of Marlboros out of the cigarette machine. (laughs) Ah, memories for you, right? Oh, my God. Those were the days. You just take your pop bottles to the UDF and cash them in. You know, 10 pop bottles, you can buy a pack of cigarettes at Angelo's two doors down (laughs) in the machine. Couldn't be more convenient. Yeah, you couldn't buy them at UDF because they would card you, right? But. Two doors down in the same little strip mall or whatever, you can go to Angelo's and put your put your coins in the machine and get your cigarettes. <laughs> Nobody's stopping you at Angelo's. Nope. Angelo's was a pizza place right by where I lived, boys and, and girls. hoagies. Apparently, everybody <laughs> liked the hoagies. And United Dairy Farmers is a, a, like a convenience store, right? It's an ice cream shop. Yeah, but it's a convenience store, too. But it's known for its ice cream. It is. I worked I worked at that UDF. Yes, I know. I still can't believe I never saw you when I would stop there every day on my way home to get my chocolate malt. I made a good chocolate malt. You probably weren't working yet, though. You were no, probably, I was probably started later in the day. Yeah, I closed a lot at night. So they bring it talking about the birds, and Mrs. Bundy says that the crows aren't smart enough to plot an attack. They're very small brains or some shit, Karen. She's not very nice. She's just dismissing everything that Melanie is saying, saying, you know, you're wrong. This isn't happening. These birds can't do this. And as she's talking, I'm thinking she's going to walk out that door and be killed <laughs> because she's cocky that way. You yeah, know, and but- she blames mankind, of course. As scientists do, Karen. <laughs> and of course, there's a man at the end of the Stoto bar or the bar there. I guess it's like a, well, this is a restaurant that has a, full service bar in it because there's lots of whiskeys and shit behind the bar yeah and the waitress but there's kids and there's families in there eating dinner and whatever it's kind of i don't know it's interesting but a man at the end of the bar says it's the end of the world yes and quotes the bible Bible so yes so you've got the bible quoter who's saying it's the end of the world there's a captain in there 
a, a fishing boat that said, you know, yes, the gulls attacked the boat. And then there's a woman with her two kids saying, you guys, shut up. You're scaring my kids. Keep your voices down. And then as they're talking, the woman's convincing them and the captain of the fishing boat is like, yeah, they were probably after my fish. And the guy's screaming, you know, it's the end of the world. And But she says it's impossible that the birds were able to do this. And then another guy comes in and gets a drink, like a businessman. He's like, just yeah. shoot them all. Just, just get a gun all. and shoot them all. Kill them and all. That's when she goes off. They're horrible creatures. The ornithologist <laughs> woman goes off and she's like, you know, you can't do that. There's 5 billion birds just in the United States, a hundred billion birds in the world. And she says, and I wrote this number down, 8,650 species of birds in the world today which was 1963. So how many species of birds do you think there are in 20? Well, I don't know. I'm going to guess 2020. How many did he say? Oh, sorry. 2023. This how, many, how many was there in 63? She, she says? She says 8,650. I'm going to say, I'm just going to round it to a nice 1.5 million. No species of birds. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 1.5 million. I should. I don't know. From 8,000 to 1.5 million species. No, I thought you said 860. Oh, you said 8,650. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then I'm not going to jump that far. I'll go. I'll go 150,000 then. That's a big jump. <laughs> so currently there are, and I quote, only 10,824 species of birds described in the world depending on the source of information. But when they... Known species, Karen. Yes, that's what... It does imply that these are the only known species. It means that they could find more. Okay. But it's it, it's interesting. It's jumped, what, 2,000 yeah, in species of 40 birds. 40 years. So I thought... I knew that, I knew that was going to be a different number. But she's kind of... What would you call her? Arrogant? Yeah, she's arrogant. Yeah, I wrote, Mrs. Bundy gives us a bunch of facts and figures about birds. That's what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> she did. So then Mitch and Deputy Al enter. And the uh, Santa Rosa, I think he says, police believe that the farmer was murdered and that the birds entered afterwards. Which upsets Mitch. Because he's like, well, why were there birds all over the floor? Why were there birds in... I mean, one, when she's there is... A gull is stuck halfway through a window and dead, you know, mm -hmm. breaking through the glass. So there's some, in addition to him being all bloody with his eyes pecked out, there's some other things in the room that are pretty gory for the time, I would think. Then they watch out the window as seagulls attack a man pumping gas. Mitch and the deputy, I think, run out there and then we see gas running down the street, Karen. Yes. So the guy's pumping gas. It's pretty impressive and the bird swoops down on his head and basically knocks him out because he falls to the ground now, i don't know yeah, how he could have knocked that. himself out hitting his head to the ground as well oh, but. that's true but it, i thought they implied the bird did it and because in the old days you know gas is just coming out so when he drops the nozzle the gas just keeps coming out the old days karen Way back in the 80s. <laughs> so then we see a man getting out of his car and he's going to light a cigar, apparently. And people in the restaurant are yelling at him, no, no, don't throw that match down. <laughs> and he's looking at him because he can't quite hear him and it, the match burns his fingers. So, of course, what's he do? Well, he, he he like flicks his hand. Like, I think he puts, his, puts the because, match out. Because it, no, it burned his fingers. But wouldn't flicking your hand? Like you're but putting that's out why the match, he, put out but, the match? <laughs> no, he flicked his hand because it was burning his fingers, and that's why he dropped it. Okay, well, he drops it, apparently, in the gasoline and lights, and he gone. And I think I've and, already told you, Karen, at least a, a cigarette will not ignite gasoline. If you drop a, lit, drop a lit cigarette in a can of gasoline, it will not ignite. That's what you've said. And I said I have a, that, I know a that bad a feeling <laughs> that there were kids experimenting in the backyard somewhere. Well, yeah. We were early Mythbusters, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Before it was a thing. I, I used to watch Mythbusters and say, shit, this is the kind of shit we used to do when we were kids. 
and now they're getting paid money for it. I know. And of course, the you know the trail of gas goes back to the gas pump, and it blows up, and and we see. But the guy who drops the the match, he gets blown up, mm-hmm. which I think again for that time is pretty impressive. I'm sure it was a stunt dude in a fire suit, but still, he's on fire. Mm-hmm. And cars don't blow up that easily anyway, either. But whatever. They do in the movies all the <laughs> yes, time. They do in the movies. And we see seagulls, an overhead shot of seagulls flying over the town with the streak of fire in the middle of it. It was pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, the bird's eye view. Very clever. So then Melanie seeks shelter in a phone booth, Karen. Yeah, I don't know why she went outside. I think everyone did for some reason. But why did they do that? I don't know. They were safe inside the restaurant. They were. And Seagull's attack as the fire department arrived to put out the fire. And I wrote, there's chaos and pandemonium. This is the only scene that I... Cats and dogs living together. (laughs) (laughs) This is the only scene I remembered from watching it in high school was the phone booth scene. Uh, Okay. Because they are pummeling that phone booth. So then Mitch runs up and grabs Melanie from the phone booth and they go back into the restaurant, which appears... Wait, right before that... A guy all bloodied mm-hmm. hits the phone booth and slides down it. So mm-hmm. it's it's pretty brutal with birds like pecking his head and shit. So they go back in the restaurant, which seems deserted, but they do find others hiding in the hallway. Away from the windows, like a tornado drill. Yeah, and then the lady with the two kids who was telling everyone to keep their voices down earlier begins to blame Melanie. All this started when you arrived. You are evil. I believe evil. you are evil. Witch. Witch. Right in the fucking face. Which yep. she <laughs> but she's crying already. She's already upset. Now she's being called evil. Yeah, yeah. they had to have someone to blame. I mean, so. she, yeah, she, Melanie would not wear that like a badge of honor as I would. <laughs> so she's upset. So then the restaurant owner enters and tells everyone that the seagulls appear to be flying away. They're done. They're tired. <laughs> They're regrouping. Retreat. So next we see Mitch and Melanie walking past the school. And at first I thought, why are they fucking going to the school? Are they just going to get her a car? But no, I guess they have to get Kathy too. Kathy's at Annie's know house. That yet. But, and the crows are all no, out Mitch there in the playground her, again. Mitch says that we got to go get Kathy at Annie's. Okay. Yep. They're all still there. The murder is still there. Murder of crows. Then... They go to Annie's house and her body is laying there on the front porch on the steps, Karen. You see she, her you know. feet. You see her feet first, and then her eyes are gone, but Mitch just kind of covers her eyes. And we don't really get a shot of them. We don't see it. And then there's like, where's Kathy? And Melanie Melanie's says, like, Where's Kathy? And we see her in the window of Annie's house. So Mitch goes in and gets her. And then Mitch starts to throw a rock at the birds, but Melanie stops him. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No. So Mitch covers Annie's body with his jacket, and Melanie tells him not to leave her there. So he picks her up and takes her inside to the house. Yeah, and Kathy tells them what happened. She said they heard the explosion, went out to see what it was, and then the birds were everywhere. And Annie pushed Kathy inside, and then the birds covered Annie. So yeah, Annie's a hero. Yeah, that takes place in the car. So they go back to Melanie's car. Mitch puts the top up this time. Thank God. <laughs> they get in the car, and Kathy tells them what happened. So then we cut to Mitch boarding up the windows of the house. And Melanie has tried to call her father, but the phone is dead. They still have power, but the phone doesn't work. Yeah, so then they begin listening to a news report on the radio from San Francisco, they think. Not much mention of it. And they're kind of upset. That's all. That's all they said. They did mention it, but they don't know what's going on. And then Lydia kind of freaks out on Mitch. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. If only your father were here. Which I don't know why that was such an insult, but whatever. No, she kind of freaks out. She does. Well, she's not the same since she saw the dead body. No. No. Mitch and Melanie step outside for some reason, and we see the birds are flying away, possibly somewhere inland, he he says, I think. Next, Kathy says she feels sick, and Melanie goes with her. I think she's vomiting. Oh, it's not good vomit sounds. She sounds like she's coughing, but whatever. 
We're supposed <laughs> to believe she vomited, though. So when they return, they hear the birds outside. Lydia grabs Kathy and runs around the room like she don't know where to go, Karen. She goes from one spot to the next. <laughs> like, it's very loud. I was like, go in the cabinets. Clear out the cabinets. You know? uh, so next we hear glass breaking and Mitch opens the drapes as a seagull tries to get in. Mitch kind of forces it back out and he puts his hand out the broken pane of glass there to draw, close the shutters. Yeah, I think that's what he's doing. And birds bite his hand. And he rips a power cord from a lamp there and ties the shutters shut with it. And right here I wrote, there's no dialogue in the scene. It's just kind of Well, it's supposed to be so loud that you wouldn't be able to hear each other. I All think there is that's is what... birds. Sound yeah. of birds. Next we see birds poking holes through a door or pecking at the door. Yeah, and you hear wings flapping the whole time. Yeah, Mitch reinforces the door. Then the lights go out. But the sounds of the birds begin to dissipate until there is none. Later that evening, Karen, everyone's asleep, apparently, and Melanie hears a flapping noise. She just says Mitch once, but he doesn't get up. So she takes the flashlight and goes to investigate. Yep. I mean, how stupid exactly is that? Exactly what I wrote. She goes upstairs, opens the door to her room, and finds that the birds have pecked a hole through the roof and are in the room. And they attack Melanie. And in the Why struggle, she closes that? the door behind her. She leans up against the door and it closes. Yes. And then she falls to the, they are attacking her, mm -hmm. biting. You see, I mean, again, it's very quick cut, but. Tearing up her lovely green outfit. And her arms and her hands and her feet. Although she's still in her shoes. The birds are eating her. Is yeah. what I wrote. <laughs> and by this time, Mitch has heard the ruck. I kept, well, I kept saying, can't they hear what's going on? But they do eventually arrive. And Mitch tries to get the door open just as she collapses in front of it. So he can't push the door open. But he does manage to grab her arm and drag her out as the birds attack Mitch and Lydia. Lydia's up there, too. Mitch carries Melanie downstairs. Tells Lydia to get antiseptic and bandages. Tells Kathy to get some brandy. Melanie looks a little out of it. Yeah, she's she's out. But then she regains consciousness and begins to swipe and punch at Mitch like she's still fighting off the birds. little PTSD there from yeah. her experience. She appears to be in shock as Mitch tries to give her some brandy. He does just put it in her mouth. Yep. <laughs> like, but... Brandy fixes everything in these old movies. Yep. Lydia bandages up Melanie. Mitch decides they should take her to a hospital. So he walks outside, and even though the birds aren't noisy, Karen, they are every fucking where. There's yes. birds everywhere. They're all around his feet as he's walking. There's crows they and trees on the porch railing. Peck at him from time to time, but yeah. just to say, get away from me. But, but he enters the garage, and there doesn't seem to be any birds in there because there's chicken wire over the windows, Karen, apparently. But they're watching him yep. through the window. Mitch turns, gets in uh, Melanie's car and turns on the radio and listens to news reports. The attacks seem to be centered on Bodego Bay for some reason. And there are minor attacks in Nobody Sebastopol knows. and Santa Rosa, but they've blocked the roads going into Bodega Bay. I thought they meant out, so I thought that meant they couldn't leave, hmm. but they do leave. I didn't even well, hear that. Well, they're saying maybe the military might go in. They haven't decided what they're going to do. Most of the people got out of the town, but there are still some left, and they're trying to figure out what the best approach is. That's what it says on the radio. So then Mitch opens the garage door and slowly drives Melanie's car out. He pulls up to the front door of the house, and he goes in to get the others. He and Lydia help Melanie walk out. She still seems to be in shock, I wrote. They leave the house, and Melanie walks out there and sees all the birds, and she, she ain't into all that, Karen. No! <laughs> but they do convince her to get into the car. Then Mitch goes back to get Kathy, and she wants to bring the lovebirds. They haven't hurt anybody. And he lets her. So he agrees, carries the cage out, and puts Kathy in the car. And then Melanie and Lydia, I wrote, have a moment in the car. A tender where, moment where she is, she experiences a mother's love probably for the first time. And since she was 11 or whatever, 
So then Mitch slowly drives away and I wrote birds are still everywhere. Sun is breaking through the clouds as they drive off. I wrote it's a nice shot. The car drives out of sight and we fade to black. The end. A universal production. That's it. All the credits, yeah. they are at the end because they front loaded all the credits back in those days. All right, Karen, anything you really enjoyed or pleasantly surprised by in this Alfred Hitchcock film? Other than the Hitchcock blonde. Well, that's your favorite thing. <laughs> I think the acting was really good. I like the acting a lot. The story's interesting. I'm surprised there wasn't a sequel because there's certainly <laughs> sequel potential. All those birds could have. It's like. It could happen in the next town and the next town. Well, if, if they town. all. It's like the orcas that are now coming together and sinking boats. And if they all separated. You would get exponential learning. So if all those birds left <laughs> and went to different places and then taught their offspring, think how fast that would go. Some of the shots were really nice. The bird's eye view, certainly really good. Like you just mentioned, the driving away shot, really nice. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a really good movie. I, I really enjoyed it. It's two hours long. It didn't feel like two hours when uh, I was watching it. Does it does to me. It did to me. I, well, I could it's see where slow. there were it's too a much slow burn. character development for you. <laughs> what about you? What did you like? I, I agree. The acting, very good. Even the special effects for the time are pretty yeah, good. Yeah, special effects yeah. for the time are very good. You can tell now that there's lots of green screen. It's, you know, it's... It wasn't done as well back then, right? You could tell. There's lots of tension, you know? Yeah, because you never know when the birds are going to start. Well, even before the birds, there's tension. There's tension between Lydia and uh, Melanie. And, and yeah, well, and you didn't know when the birds were going to start. Like I had this whole thing of like. Is it now? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's ten You're right. There's tension between Mitch and Melanie when they meet. Then there's tension between Melanie and Annie uh -huh. a little. Then there's tension between Melanie and Lydia. Yep. And then there's tension with the town folks and Melanie. There is a lot of personal, interpersonal tension. And just watching her sitting there on the bench while those kids are freaking singing forever. And the, the suspense builds. The yeah. Whole and, film. and the crows just gathering behind her, not doing anything, just... All Hanging over out. the playground equipment. Like, Creating a murder. Planning one, yes, for <laughs> sure. Just becoming, becoming the murder. Be the murder. Yeah, I kept, um, as we kind of alluded to, we, we watched this film in an English class in high school. Right, Karen? That's what I remember, but I don't remember why. Or... It's mass media, I'm sure. English class. But I was as I was watching it, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's a thing. But I don't know why or what it's about. Because I remember the talking about Annie being a brunette. And she dressed in dark black, like a black blouse and whatever a lot. And then Melanie being a blonde, you know, in brighter trust colors. trust those brunettes that dress in black. That's just. <laughs> no, there's a lot of that, you know, and when you're in high school, I. It's funny because I remember writing a big, long, big term paper about the flower symbolism in The Great Gatsby. And I was just making it up, right? <laughs> and you wonder the whole time when you're all these people are saying these things and you're like, maybe Hitchcock just liked black blouses. Like, we don't know, you know, but I think there is a lot of symbolism and stuff in this movie. I remember like taking notes about the smokers and smoking and I mean I, I have a feeling it's a lot of man versus nature kind of thing. Yep. I remember talking about the caged birds, the caged love birds. Which is and interesting. And even talking about the caged birds in the pet shop. In, in the, the pet shop. And they even mention it. Don't you think it's cruel to cage the mm -hmm. birds in the beginning? But the love birds who are the actual caged birds never act out. No, they don't. Which is kind of an interesting twist. And then that, I kind of read a little bit in that uh, book that um, Dr. Craig gave us. Dr. Craig, yeah, uses. 
that Robin Wood guy talks a lot about sexual tension in this film. Somehow. Well, they had they had good chemistry, those two. Yeah. I felt more of Annie's pain that I thought she did a really good job of letting people know that she was in pain with every little cut that, you know, Mitch called for Melanie. Melanie brought lovebirds. You know, you could see it on her face. And I thought she was excellent in it because she didn't want to give it up. She, this any was her chance, first film. She was good, I thought. Really good. Yeah, acting was really good. What'd you think of the soundtrack, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> the birds? That's all yeah, it was. There was none. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Except for her playing the piano. Everything else was all birds, which was interesting. Yeah, you it was interesting need, that there were no dialogue and lots of like tense parts. I mean, it was kind of added to the tension. <laughs> I don't know. Well, they had to act with their faces. <laughs> I mean, they had to show fear and confusion and panic all without saying anything. Yeah. Anything you didn't like? I won't say there's anything I didn't like about the film. I will say looking at it from 2023, the ease with which information was shared was yes. a little shocking. I won't say I didn't like it, but it's an interesting. We were both, I'm sure you were shocked multiple times. Like, wow, they're just going to tell her where he lives. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really happen anymore. That's a big change in society, I think. Yeah. That we found that unbelievable that people would do that. You want to know his other security question yeah. and answers? <laughs> he was born in wherever or whatever. I mean, you know. even the fact His that first dog was named. <laughs> <laughs> even the neighbor. Like, I don't know how friendly you are, but how how would you Come know? Come on, Karen. You know In I'm your friendly. apartment building, would your neighbor across the way know where you went every weekend? No. I mean, it's just a different perspective. It was interesting to me to see how... That has changed didn't a little bit. Didn't even know my neighbor. I mean, I knew some neighbors. 90% of the time I didn't, but a couple times I did. If they usually were Hitchcock if it's... blondes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they were Hitchcock blondes, you'd know them. But usually it's someone who says, hey, can you walk my dog this weekend? I'm going out of town or water my plants for a week. They usually, it starts with someone needing something. And goes from there usually. But this guy knew where he went, why he went there, you know, and just spilled it all. It's just interesting. I wouldn't say I it's not that I didn't like it. It's just something that. Yeah, it's different. It's different shocking. time period. Yes. Uh, the early 60s. I mean, usually you noticed clothes difference. You I mean, there was cars no, difference. You, know, you couldn't use that information really for much back in the 60s. True. <laughs> not like you can now did you yeah. not like anything um you, you said it was a little slow see it I was like, a little slow i like when they give me a little bit about the characters a little bit of a slow burn one terrible see the second half went a lot quicker than the first i'll say that i thoroughly enjoyed it okay i i'm very surprised there were no sequels or that it hasn't been has it been remade don't at all so. nobody's touched it because they redid psycho and they've done a you know never as good but a plan remake was announced in 2007 it was scrapped there was a sequel poorly received television sequel karen okay well that's not the same the birds 2 lands in in 1994 i mean it's 30 years later Directed by Alan Smithy, Karen. If you know what who Alan Smithy is, you know how not. good the film is. Okay. So that's a pseudonym directors use when they don't want their name associated with the film. Oh, is it? <laughs> yes. I never knew that. That's funny. Yes, it is. Write that down in things we learned this week. I knew that already. Well, I didn't. <laughs> if you know Tippi Hendren is Melanie Griffith's mother, you can see Melanie Griffith's in her sometimes oh, she's much better than melanie griffith though no but her face and i think yeah. it's her eyes or something you you see the resemblance every once in a while not all the time I, I but think, i think she's I think she's a she's a little hotter than melanie griffith too. 
but in my well, opinion, I'm not, I'm not gonna comment on that, but I'm just saying you can see it. And Tippy Hedron it. was in the sequel as a cameo or, or a supporting role or something. Yeah, not much not to like about it, I think. You're right. It's definitely a slow burn, and there isn't a lot of gory horror in it. But if you think about it. Yeah, I was going to ask you if this would you is this even a horror film? I think it's a horror film. Yeah. Okay. There's something that we don't understand attacking and killing people. And there's some gore in there. But it's just one of those yeah. thinkers when you walk outside. Yeah, they call know. it a natural horror thriller, which is kind of like the frogs. Right. Ooh. Remember the frogs? That was a good one. Yeah, but that was something though that man actually did. They Correct. used too much. Pesticide. Yeah, this and this one, it was never explained what was going on. They which were just isn't, pissed. Maybe that's that's why thing. it's like the orcas. I'm that's, telling you. That's why it's another maybe that's something else I didn't like about it. I'm surprised you didn't say when we were finished. I have questions. <laughs> well, I did have questions, but you always make fun of me when I say that. So I'm just, that's why I asked about the lovebirds casually. Okay. Yeah. It leaves lots of questions, which isn't bad. Like, no, I you don't of, find out if they get to the hot, like that's I why. kind of enjoy that actually walking out of a movie theater. If I see a movie in a movie theater, I'm thinking, what the fuck was that about? What, 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 what happened? Why? I mean, the birds could have driven them into the ocean off of the Pacific Highway. You don't even know if they get to the hospital. No, it's very open-ended ending. That's why it's a, I thought for sure there'd be a sequel. Sequel potential. Gotta love that. All right, Karen. What kind of cocktail rating? It's a two. It is. I agree. It's a strong two. It's a two. All right, Karen, would you like to hear some reviews from the time, Karen? Ooh, Critics Corner. Yes. So first, I'll, first, I'll say that this has a 94% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 7.6 out of 10 approval rating on IMDb, and 79% of Google users like this movie. Stupid Google users. Pretty high. The first review I have is from The Hollywood Reporter. Dated March 28th, 1963. And I am paraphrasing. Alfred Hitchcock has concocted an elaborate tease in the birds as if to prove that suspense and thrills can be induced as much by the expectation of horror as by horror itself. What audiences are expecting and shiveringly hoping for after Psycho is more of the same. Deliberately, Hitchcock prolongs his prelude to horror for more than half the film, playing with audience suspense with comedy and romance while he sets his stage. The horror, when it comes, is a hair-raising and audiences should take to the universal release with satisfying response. Hitchcock and the uh, screenwriter Evan Hunter, Evan Hunter make no symbolism of their story. Like most good horror stories, it is based on a simple what-if premise, with the abnormal substituted for the normal. The revolt of the birds acting contrary to nature and their established habits is convincingly presented. The fact that birds are the last element of nature one expects to turn on man only underlines the horror. If you can't trust birds, who can you trust? There is one chink in the premise. That is the unanswered and unposed question of why nobody ever gets a gun and blasts away at the wing assault. <laughs> <laughs> she said why. It's futile. Yeah. Rod Taylor and a newcomer, Miss Hendren, play the romantic leads. Taylor is strong and conv convincing. Miss Hendren, a cool blonde beauty in the Hitchcock tradition, handles herself with finesse and is promising. Jessica Tanya gives an outstanding performance as Taylor's neurotic mother. Suzanne Plachette is strong as Taylor's former girlfriend. So they liked the acting, too. They did. Next one I have is from Variety. December 31st, 1962. This one I will read it in its entirety. It's pretty short. Beneath all this elaborate feather bedlam lies a hitch cock and bull story that's essentially a foul ball. Foul, F-O-U-L. 
ball. They were clever. The premise is fascinating. The idea of billions of bird brains refusing to eat crow any longer and adapting. <laughs> They're so clever variety. <laughs> the idea of billions of bird brains refusing to eat crow any longer and adopting the hunt and peck system with homo sapiens as their ornithological target is fraught with potential. Cinematically, Hitchcock and company have done a masterful job of meeting this formidable challenge. But dramatically, The Birds is little more than a shocker for shock's sake. Evan Hunter's screenplay from Daphne Du, whatever her name is, you said it. How do you say it? Marat, Mar, Marar. Muar. Du Marar's story. Has it that a colony of our feathered friends over California's Bodego Bay, and it says in parentheses, it's never clear how far reaching this avian mafia extends, suddenly decides for no apparent reason to swoop down en masse on the human population beaks first. These bird raids are captivatingly bizarre and terrifying. Where the scenario and picture slip is in the sphere of human element. An unnecessary elaborate romantic plot has been cooked up and then left suspended. It involves a young bachelor attorney, his sister, and their mother, and a plucky mysterious playgirl whose arrival from San Francisco with a pair of caged lovebirds for Taylor coincides with the outbreak of avian hostility. Aside from the birds, the film belongs to Hedron, who makes an auspicious screen bow. She virtually has to carry the picture alone for the first 45-minute stretch prior to the advent of the first wave of organized attackers from the sky. Of the others, Tandy, a first-class actress, makes the most vivid impression. Taylor emotes with strength and attractiveness. Yeah, it's interesting if you think about it, and I didn't while I was watching the film, but after listening to those, that humans were the only thing they attacked. It wasn't cows or, nope. you know, it was just humans. And also, like they said, and I did wonder during the film why it was just in that one area. Yeah. Never was explained, was it? No. What'd you think of our drink, The Crow? I, you know, I thought I was not going to like this drink just because it's basically whiskey with a little bit of lemon juice in it. I you like whiskey, good. but not straight. I tell you this every this time. This isn't straight. No, but there's only a little bit of lemon, lemon juice. Lemon juice in and it. grenadine. It's pretty sweet. It's sweet and sour at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I like it. It was fine. It was okay. Not my favorite, but it's evaporated. <laughs> no, but I think it's a. It's a slow burn, Greg. It's sitting at the bar, order a fancy drink. No, I wouldn't order this. I liked it. It was fine. I'm not going to, you know, sit around the house and have one occasionally. I could see where people, it's like a reading a book next to the fireplace kind of drink, sipping it. It's it's more of very a, slowly over the evening. I could see that, like a winter time yeah. fireplace drink. Yeah, yeah, that's what it reminds me of. Not that nothing that you would drink quickly, just sip every it's once. Not in a, a while. lanai drink, though. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not down in a bunch of these. <laughs> all right, what did we learn today, Karen? Anything? Anything at all? Alan Smithy. We did. What did we learn about Bodega Bay, about a murder of crows? You talked we, about Edith Head. Mina Birds is M-Y-N-A-H. That's what I got. Okay. Daphne Manumwa, Du Du Muwa. What? Yeah, you'll have to look that one up, but it's du a Marne, short story. Du Mare. I don't know what yeah. how to say your name. The Aston Martin DB2 slash four. Well, that was our coupe. favorite thing in the whole movie. The favorite thing we learned. <laughs> Pretty expensive little sports car. Pick one up for a, about a quarter of a million. <laughs> well, it's just when they were all going to go in her car to leave, I thought, are they going to fit in there? Or are they going to fit? It looked in there? like there was back seats. Was there back I, seats? In there? I guess there must, there had to be, but I just thought they're never going to fit in there. 
It is. But, it would be faster than the truck, as he says. Yes, but. All right, Karen. Next film. Unless there's anything else. Nope, it's all you. What do you got? Oh, it's my turn. The film I have chosen, Karen, is Sleepy Hollow. The Johnny Depp. The Johnny Depp Sleepy Hollow. Why'd you choose that one? Well, Karen, our next episode comes out August 23rd, and Tim Burton's birthday is August 25th. And he directed Sleepy Hollow. (laughs) Okay. The Johnny Depp one. (laughs) The Johnny Depp one, (laughs) as it will officially be known from now on. Do you have a drink to go with it? I do, Karen. Excellent. What's that? The drink I've chosen is called the Headless Horseman Cocktail. Ah, oh, it's a big stretch. You, you think it'll be in there? there? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you make that? So we're going to need pumpkin beer, crema de cacao, coffee liqueur, is and that, vodka. What's coffee liqueur? Kahlua. Kahlua. Okay. Coffee liqueur, vodka, and moonshine. <laughs> oh, my God. This sounds horrible. Well, the moonshine is just to light it on fire. Oh, to light it on fire. Okay. Yep. Two ounces of pumpkin beer, two ounces of crema de cacao, two ounces of Kahlua or coffee liqueur, and one ounce vodka. And then a little bit of high flammable alcohol on the top and then light it on fire. That's going to pack a punch. I hope so. Do you have time? That to sounds make... good, though. Do you have? I think it sounds terrible. <laughs> Chocolate, coffee, and pumpkin. Ugh, beer, though. And beer. I don't okay. like coffee or beer. I don't like coffee, but I kind of like Kahlua coffee flavored stuff. Don't know why I like, don't like coffee. That don't make sense, does it? Not really, but <laughs> sometimes you don't make sense, Greg. True, Karen. You're a mystery. Just keep us guessing. An enigma. All right. So that'll be next week, Karen. Sleepy Hollow. You ever seen that before? I have. I have too. I think my wife and I saw it in theaters. I think we were dating. You took her to all those movies, those lovely romantic movies when you were dating. (laughs) Actually, it is kind of. When did this come out? Yeah, 1999. We were dating. I think I took her to this, and she took me to um, The Sixth Sense. <laughs> That's the one she picked. I picked this one. Interesting. Yeah, I know. Right? And she kind of knew the twist at the end. of this. She knew the twist, and I had no idea about The Sixth oh, Sense. I didn't, know, I didn't know either. I didn't either. When I saw it, when I first saw it. But she did. So th- thankfully, I guess she didn't tell me. <laughs> Let me find out for myself, but... But anyway, that's next week. Sleepy Hollow from 1999. The Johnny Depp one, Karen. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Anyone you need to thank this week? Well, as always, I want to thank our listener. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thank you for spending time with us. What about you, Greg? Who do you need to thank? As always, Karen, I need to thank the band Verse 13 for providing all the music in the Scary Spirits podcast. The music definitely makes the podcast better. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Hey, it's Karen, and I'm here to talk to you about getting social with us. Did you know you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast? Or check out our website, scaryspirits.com. If you have something to say, email us at info at scaryspirits.com. And as always, thanks so much for listening. Please drink responsibly.